Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, award-winning broadcaster and facilitator, Iman Rapeti. Okay, I wanted it to be really, really loud because I wanted to shatter your eardrums this morning. Just, I want you to put your hand on your wrist. Is there a pulse? I think we're good. We're all in the room looking amazing, and I know that we have struggled through traffic this morning. But I want you to take a deep breath in. It's possible. Deep breath in. Just hold it and release it. I want us all to be very much connected to our session um, this morning. If you have attended a gathering where I've played this song before, it's only because I really, I think this idea and this concept of being connected to our power is so important. We can talk about keeping the lights on. That's a, a battle all of you in this room are seized with playing every single day. But the one light that we can control is which one? It's the one that's inside. It's our light. And I think it's now more than ever that we have to remember and we have to reanimate our power. There's so much happening in Joburg, let alone, you know, the country or the province or the globe. Sometimes it feels like going outside is an extreme sport, doesn't it? It's, oh my gosh, what's going to happen today? So the question I want you to think about before we get into our purpose is to think about ourselves. Who's keeping your light on? This morning, if some of you came in and the watts weren't that strong and you're thinking, ugh, you know, another day in the world, another struggle that I need to overcome today, I want you to think very clearly and very carefully that if you're not taking care of yourself and if you're not keeping your light bright and shining, it's going to be very hard to do the things that need to be done in the sector right now. So I'm just getting a word from my producer. Oh, it's not a motivational speech. Okay, it's a conference. Okay, so let me get on with the business of conferencing then. We've got a lot to cover in a very short space of time, so I want to, to get through that. But I ran into a dear kid saying near the lift this morning, and as we pressed the button, the lights went off. And we were like, oh, thank goodness we didn't get into the lift. And a few minutes later, when the power was reestablished, this other guy comes out. Look, I mean, it was like three minutes we were standing there. He looked so traumatized, he stumbled out of that lift. But the question that she asked me this morning was, as women in energy, what are we doing about this crisis? And it's a small, small thing. So that's what we want to do today. We want to be hyper-focused. There's a lot happening in this space and a lot we can talk about. But let's be hyper-focused on why we are here today, the reason that we have all gathered and, and brought you um, all the way to Johannesburg in terrible traffic this morning. We want to look at the contributions and the limitations of women in the energy se sector. Simple enough. And you are all here to share a little story. I'm sure you have um, a, a very keen perspective on how it affects you in your sphere of influence. But we have to think about how it all forms this tapestry of influence together across the sector in South Africa. We had this fantastic BRICS meeting the other day. And I don't know how many of you were thinking, well, you know, what's my slice of the pie? How am I going to be involved? How are, you know, how's my company? How's my business? How's my own, you know, my own objectives going to be advanced in this big thing? And if we can't see ourselves in that photograph of excellence and of progress and of hopefully for a lot of our entrepreneurs in the room making profits, um, then we really are wasting our time and we're beginning to think small. So today is all about looking at what's in the space. How can we collaborate? Do you all know everyone in the room? Not really. Well, what I'm hoping for today is that you establish those connections and those collaborations. Have conversations. Hello, good morning. Who are you? Where are you from? I'm doing such and such. Can we have a coffee maybe if you establish that, that, that interest? One of the things that in my observation in the work that I do is that often we just keep ourselves so small. We'll often move in the same circles. We'll be a little bit safe in, in who we know and, and who we want to trust. But really now is the time to move into a completely different sphere and a different kind of you know, understanding of your power. You've got to start meeting new people. It's not the first day of school because we've got a lot of work to do. We have a national objective that we need to reach. So we need everyone to be building those collaborations. So the Financial Mail, together with the CEF Group, is looking forward in this moment to make sure that we leave today oxygenated, energized. The light is shining at full strength. 
um, ready to, to do what we need to do in the space next. And if I look around just the world, and even historically, I mean, women have always been leading the way. When you think of midwifery, when you think of medicine, in old societies, women's contribution at the forefront is as old as humanity itself. We were always there. We have always been there. So where are we today? Why are we still having conversations when we're thinking about where are we in this space or in that space and the boards aren't transformed and we need to create allies? That is still, in my view, a bit of a primitive conversation for us to be having 30 years into democracy and 30 years into this proficiency in the language of power that women have had. So what is holding us back? Today, hopefully, we advance that discussion. And our allies are in the room. Where are the brothers? Thank you so much. I was asked three times, please make sure, mention the men in the room. And we know that, when, especially when it comes to board level and in executive positions, we do need our male allies. We need people to advocate for us when we're not in the room. I know so-and-so who's really brilliant at this. She should be brought in. So thank you very much for already doing that work. I know that you are doing it beautifully. We've never met before, but I'm just assuming that you are one of those guys, a strong male ally to the women in your space. All right. So are we ready, ladies and gentlemen? I need a little bit more than that because we need your energy for the next 90 minutes or so. So are we re ready, ladies and gentlemen? I love it. I also want to acknowledge our online audience. You're very much a part of our session today. In fact, one of our speakers is joining us online. So send your questions, send some of your thoughts, and I'll make sure that I feed those through to the panel. Now, during our briefing, CF, CEO Ayanda Noah said, Iman, it's going to be lit. <laughs> Do you agree? <laughs> yeah, I, I get a yes from here. More yeses in the room. It's going to be lit, hopefully. All right, so let's light the grenade. Okay, maybe a grenade is too excessive. Let's light the firecracker and let's get things going. So I want to just share with you some housekeeping rules. Make sure that your phones aren't silent. Uh, the ladies and gents are just outside the door. And please tweet or X as much as you can. Uh, and the hashtag is women in energy, hashtag Central Energy Fund SA, or hashtag energy. And if you want to, you can start with some selfies of some of you that are looking so gorgeous. Some of us took time to face beat this morning, and I appreciate you for that. Um, take a couple of selfies and tweet those or X those, and uh, we'll share them with everyone later. All right, so I want you to give a great big round of applause for our real host, the chairperson of the CEF group, Ayanda Noah. Well, 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 well. Happy Heritage Month. So I see somebody got the message today that it is actually Heritage Month. I think one or two people did. Um, it really is a great privilege to be standing here in front of you today. And really, um, you know, having this opportunity to talk a little bit more about what are women in energy doing? We just had our Women's Month, so we only have one women's recognition in a year. But I want to say to you, Happy Women's Month, and I also want to say Happy Women's Day. Women's Day is every day, isn't it? It actually is every day. And looking at how beautiful you look, and I'm sure the people that are online as well, they look as great. I just want you to just give yourself acknowledgement. Just say, I look great. I feel great today. Tell yourself, and then tell the person next to you, brother, brother, that includes you. I think there's, I, yeah, there's another brother. Here's another brother. Here, two brothers. Tell each other, you look great. Brother, you look great. Don't, don't I look great? You know what, guys? I feel great. I really, really, really feel great about today. So let's get started because um, I, I, I'm really hoping that it's going to be a lit session today. I'm looking forward to a very um, informative session. I'm looking forward to having you uh, really just, you know, taking it in and taking a couple of lessons that we are going to be sharing with yourselves as the panel. 
And, and where I want to start off, really, I just want to make three points today. And, and I think the balance of the points really are going to be coming from the panel, so I don't want to get too much into that. But I want to latch on to the point that Iman made about the role of women from way back then. And I just want to look at it just from nature. What has nature given us to do as women? We have multiple roles that we play, okay? Multiple roles. We are mothers, we are wives, we are partners, we are sisters, we are companions, we are lovers. We have multiple roles that we play in the community. But I think the biggest one that I want to just put on the platform today is that we have a big gift and a privilege of caring children. We have a privilege of having nine months of a life growing in ourselves. Can you ever think how powerful that is? That is a very, very, very powerful privilege that we have as women. We carry lives, we nurture lives. We are multiple, you know, we're mothers, we teach. When a child grows up, we teach them. You know, I, I, I'm certainly thinking of the time when my kids were small, and at six months, I had to teach them to eat. And I can still see that picture of being a mother and teaching them something that they don't know, and them having to adjust uh, and grow up. Um, we really play multiple roles. We provide security in the home, we are security officials, we are managers at home, we are CEOs of our homes. We are really many who are community builders, who are economists at home, isn't it? We have stock fails. I mean, think about it. You know, way back then when the community would get together as women and say, we need to do something about the way that we live, we need to stretch our money, we need to do a whole host of things to make sure that there is sustainability uh, going into the future. So we really have the key, the main key for sustainable development and for improving the quality of life. So the question is, why is it that women are 52% in terms of the population in South Africa and about 50% in the world and yet, when you come to the boardroom, what is the representation? Very, very small. It's very, very small. So I want to just look at the economy. What is the role of energy in the economy? Energy is the oxygen of the economy. Without energy, the economy stops. In fact, this morning, I had a very, very cold shower. I was actually very, very upset. I love my um, shower. I love being in water. And I literally had to have a two, three-minute shower this morning because the water was cold. And you know why? Because I had load shedding from two in the morning until half past six in the morning. And I have to get two daughters ready to go to school in cold water. And my kids were at home yesterday because they were sick. And this morning I had to bath them in cold water so that they can get to school because I was not having children at home today. And the water was cold. It was cold. It reminded me of a time when I was at boarding school. Uh, I think it was standard, uh, I'm giving up my age now, it was standard five, thereabouts. I went to a very rural boarding school and we washed in cold water, summer, winter, cold water. And it reminded me, I don't, want, I don't want to have a cold shower. No, I don't have. I don't have it. So today, again, to me, was a reminder of the importance and significance of energy in our lives. It provides for a functional, efficient, uh, and very competitive economy. How many businesses have closed down because we don't have electricity? How many businesses have closed down? How many people have not been able to go to work because there hasn't been transport to take them to, to work? So you see the significance and the importance of energy. It actually facilitates for economic development, for growth. 
It facilitates for the competitiveness of a country, and it also facilitates for the country to really be sustainable going into the future, and also make sure that we deal with the triple challenge that we have as South Africa. We know the inequality of South Africa is the highest in the world. We are the most unequal country in the whole world. The poverty is really, it's palpable, you can feel it. You can feel it, you can see it, you can smell it, you can cut it. That's how bad it is. Our unemployment rate in the 40%. You know, some countries say, oh, uh, you know, if you go to the US, our oh, unemployment rate is in the uh, 5%, uh, 7%, and they say it's very high. And I'm thinking, wow, 7% high unemployment rate. And we are running up in the 40s. So we have a lot of work, ladies. We really have a lot of work. And there are many opportunities in the energy field, as you will hear today. But I think for me, the biggest question is, in an industry that is so important, in an industry that is so significant, why is it that we are still talking about women representation that is so low in an environment that is supposed to be powering the economy of the country. So that is a question that we're going to be unpacking, as Iman has already said. Let me make the last point and then sit down. And the last point, really, it would be remiss of me if I don't tell you what Central Energy Fund is all about. Right? So that's what I'm going, I'm going to do now. And tell you that Central Energy Fund is a Schedule II state-owned company. And what it means is that it's got a dual mandate. The first mandate being a commercial sustainability mandate, meaning that we cannot go to our shareholder and ask for money. We've got to make our own money. So we are an adult, we are an old child, we've got to, we really have to hustle. Hustle, get the money, and make sure that the company is uh, running efficiently and that we pay for our way out of our own pocket. The second one, which is very critical, is a developmental role, meaning that we support the government in making sure that we deal with the triple challenge, we deal with all the ills, the social ills that we know of, and we make sure that government uses us as a vehicle to grow the economy and to take people out of poverty. Our mandate really is to ensure that the security of energy supply in the country that is looking at both the electricity side of, of things and also the oil and gas, which is really, in simple terms, where we get fuels that we use for transportation, fuel that we use for other products, uh, petroleum chemical industries, for example. So we are a very, very important uh, state-owned company. We have a SAF Act, which basically uh, gives us the power to do what we do uh, and to deliver on our mandate. We do have five state-owned companies that are subsidiaries to uh, Central Energy Fund, which assist and support in making sure that there is energy security in the country. If I start off with the first one being African Exploration, Finance and Mining Company, AEMFC, which is really our state-owned mining company. Currently, it looks at supplying ESCOM with coal, uh, to make sure that the power stations are powered up and they are able to deliver energy to the rest of the country. I guess is another um, state-owned uh, subsidiary of a Central Energy Fund, and it co-owns a pipeline which comes from Mo Mozambique, uh, 865 kilometers of line, coming from Mo Mozambique to South Africa, bringing gas uh, from Mozambique. And then we've got the Petroleum Agency of South Africa, PASA, which really promotes the oil and gas development and also makes sure that it regulates uh, across, the, across the board. Petro SA, which you might be familiar with, um, and will not say why uh, at the moment, um, it is mainly in the exploration and production uh, space. Uh, and also owns a very small refinery. Uh, one of the six refineries uh, in the country uh, is situated down in Mosul Bay, 
And then we've got Strategic Fuel Fund, uh, which basically we call it an infrastructure uh, company. If you look at all the oil tanks uh, that you see in Milnerton, for those of you who observe, when you fly down to Cape Town, you'll see a farm, a tank farm that is there, that is owned by Strategic Fuel Fund, uh, which basically um, takes care of the strategic stock uh, of South Africa, uh, which is the crude oil that get, then gets refined in the refineries so that we can get our petroleum products. So those are five companies that we have in a, um, a central energy fund. And then the last one, uh, which we are busy with, and I'm sure in due course we are going to be talking about it and really just giving it a bit of a spotlight, is the South African National um, SANPC, South African National Petroleum Company. These acronyms uh, get one just, you know, having to bite your tongue all the time. Um, that is a company that is really a merger of, I guess, with Strategic Fuel Fund and Petro SA, so that we can have one company as part of the consolidation of the state-owned companies, which is a government mandate. We'll talk about that at some point, but really those five companies make sure that we secure energy solutions to power all. I'm going to end it off at that point and say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm hoping that you're going to have a lit, lit, lit day today. So I'm looking forward to that, and thank you very much. You are all welcome. Thank you. Stay with me and we'll kick things off um, straight away. I'll introduce some of our panelists. Ayanda, you are more than welcome to sit to the left of me. And I'll bring in some of the other panel, panel members as well. You know what's so interesting? We talk a lot about the structural impact of energy deficits or load shedding or power cuts, which is the less elegant term in South Africa. But we don't talk as much about the psychological effects of living in the dark. A lot of our communities in South Africa have been living in the dark for the longest time. Some of them have only known living in the dark, being in communities, informal settlements, and so on. But there is a massive psychological impact to living in the dark. The body produces these high levels of melanin, uh, melatonin. It makes you want to feel groggy. It makes you want to sleep. It reduces your level of serotonin. You know, serotonin's your happy drug. It keeps you going. It makes you feel happy and optimistic. And it depresses the, your body's supply of that. So is it any wonder in South Africa that a lot of us can seem so gloomy and be so even more exponentially affected by the lack of power? Because even though we don't have electricity, people are feeling disempowered. There's a lack of power. So we're sitting with an entire society that is, that is depressed. Our role is to make sure that we can change that picture and we find out how to do that in this room today. For those of you who don't really know some of the organizations and the entities um, that have been mentioned already, today is that day to, to really understand how the space is working and most importantly, how you can have access to areas that you might not have thought there, there could be access or there should be access for you. So let's really listen with that sort of mind um, and, and that in mind this morning. So who do we have on our panel? Let me start with um, our guest online, and that is Rafil Webutelezi, who is a professional engineer, uh, engineer and president of the Engineering Council of South Africa. Looking gorgeous, darling. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> I hope you feel very much a part of us. Um, and I also want to welcome Ntokozo Nkwabe, who's the uh, Deputy Director General, Mining, Minerals and en Energy Policy Department. We're not sure if uh, Ntokozo is with us yet, so as soon as she does arrive, we will welcome her to the stage. But Dr. Pindile Masangane, who's the Vice President of Regulation and Policy, Global Market H2 Development. And I want to say the gorgeous Nozizwe Matamo, who is non-executive director at the Strategic Fuel Fund. Please give all of our guests a warm round of applause. So it's really wonderful to have all of you with us um, this morning. And there will be enough opportunity for you to ask questions. So just think about the things that you really want to pose to each of our guests, and I'll put, that, put it to them later. <laughs> and I think, uh, Rafiwa, since you're online, let's kick off um, with you. Where are the women in the energy sector? 
Uh, I know that Ayanda mentioned representation. If we look at sort of global statistics, uh, they don't look so they don't look so great. If I, I just want to quickly go to the last stat that I picked up. Um, I think 22% in the oil and gas uh, industry, 32 in renewable energy. That's just in the wor workforce. We're not even talking about ownership. And then in the global average, 47%. But again, we're not necessarily talking about ownership there. So tell us what we're looking at. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for having me. <clears throat> I do agree it's going to be a lit day. I just have a bit of a flu today, <laughs> but I will do my best. Um, Imam, the women are not there. The picture is not looking great, um, but I do believe that we are fast developing the pipeline. Um, let me speak from an engineering point of view. At the moment, we're looking at the Engineering Council of South Africa having approximately 50,000 registered professionals. That is engineers, technologists, technicians. Of all of that, only 14% are women. So, so if you look at the pipeline within the engineering space, professionals, we can see that we are not really in a good position to say we've got enough females in the space of professional engineering. And then we expand into the energy sector, which obviously takes more than just the engineers. And that is the stats that then you are looking at. So I'm here now to say we have a lot of students that are coming up. We have to start at ground level. The pipelining must be clear at that level. We need people who would advocate for education. We need people who will assist in promotion of STEM subjects. We need, we need the woman to go out there and lead by example, hold all to some students, adopt some students and assist them in navigating the sector. The girls at schools are not exposed to what they should be at the moment. And I do think that it is our duty to do that. I don't want to get into the aspect of the boardroom, as 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 uh, Ms. Ayanda Noya spoke about. They are few and far apart in terms of having representatives of women. So we need to start looking at how we then, as females, also bring other females on board as we navigate the space that we are navigating. From an and mining sector, from the energy sector, we still seeing a lot of a gap between the females that are participating. The good news, however, that I've noticed is that companies are starting to be intentional in their policy development, saying we want to still see the woman. We want the woman owned companies to come aboard. We want to have projects that are sidelined for women to participate in. But these women will still need mentorship from a champion champions that are sitting in the room today to assist, to hold their hand and to help them navigate the space as they start developing in the space of entrepreneurship. So I do think that it might not look as shiny as we might want it to be, but the more of us are coming into the space, the more of us are also pulling and lifting the other women as we ride. We're not cutting the ladder as we lift, we get lifted up that ladder. It's really Let encouraging. me stop there for now. Really encouraging to hear that. You know, it's been Women's Month, so a lot of us have been in many gatherings uh, where women have been. And, you know, some of the anecdotes you hear is that, yes, once women get up, they, they kick the ladder down. <laughs> or, you know, they, once they've figured out the map, they kind of burn uh, the directions to the boardroom or into success. So it's really refreshing, uh, Rafil, to hear that in this particular sector, um, there does seem to be allyship. There does seem to be mentorship. The thing is, we need to accelerate it, right? So I would love to hear from each of you um, what your picture is of the place of women, especially in your, in your business unit or in your sphere of influence. P yeah, we can, we, you can go, Pindile, if you want to. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Iman. Um, I must say that um, the statistics that my fellow panelist has just uh, spoken to is, is not really encouraging if you look at the registered engineers. But I'm happy that she points out that indeed we do have a, a strong pipeline when it comes to the, straw, to the workforce, when it comes to the universities, and we need to grow those. Um, let me congratulate my former employer, of course, uh, the Central Energy Fund. You know that they won the, the, uh, the prize for being the most empowered organization. And I think for me, that mentoring and that encouragement in the boardroom is something that I saw being lived at the Central Energy Fund. It, it really is very much alive. 
Um, and I think it's largely because uh, our leaders have for a long time been women. Been women. Uh, like begets like. Uh, Iman. So for me, the issue mm. of having women in top leadership position is, if anything, it achieves making sure that the organization itself is transformed. Because inherently, yes. those people tend to coach the other women, and those women came up. I started rising up uh, in the SEF group of companies at the time of Magebu Simabuza, when she was the chairperson of the board. Of course, um, the host today is now the chairperson, and that's what she's doing, trying to encourage women to make sure they find their voice, to make sure that they are coached professionally to rise up. But I think for me, importantly, is that um, when you look at corporate, sometimes it's, it, 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 it's both. It's us women as well not raising up our hands. When these challenges rise, when those opportunities come up, I think half the time, I believe in this um, the, that, that comes out many times in publications, that a woman given an opportunity to lead will say 10 reasons why she's not suitable. And a man will say, okay, I'm not ready, but I'll go. You know? yeah. And I think it's time for us to do that and to, to, to understand that actually, most of the time we are better leaders than men, in my view. You know, we make... Sorry, okay. guys. <laughs> we, we, we do make for better leadership, and I think we make stronger organizations. And therefore, I uh, would today really challenge everyone in the room to say, when the opportunity rises, let us raise our hands. Let's also raise our voices, you know? So I think half the time, an issue is happening in the organization. We are not speaking. The men are speaking. And therefore, when chairpersons of board have to appoint a person, they've never had a Pindile Masangane voice. So for me, I would say, let's offer our opinions, let's shape the narrative, and, and, and let's put um, our thoughts out there, which most of the time are the most excellent and their superior thinking anyway. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, wow, I like the last part there, superior thinking. Just yeah. <laughs> notes. But I think there's an important aspect that you mentioned. Again, men, statistically, these are in HR surveys uh, the world over. If there are 10 requirements for a job and they have three, they will apply. Yeah. I, I know for myself, in jobs that I've applied for, it's been a long time since I've applied for a job, thankfully. But if I don't have at least seven or eight, I'm not applying. I've already checked myself out of the game. So I think that that is a really important note to make, is to actually lean in and go for it. The rest you will get as you go along, especially when you think of the fact that our counterparts are not hesitating mm. um, at all. Uh, Nosis, where again, I'd like to hear fr from your perspective more on the policy side of things. You know, you know what the... I don't want to say the plight of women is because I don't like this idea that we have to survive in the industries and that we constantly victimize. Um, but, but how does the, 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 the real picture and the realities that women face in the sector filtering through to the spaces where policy is being written? Now, we've heard a hundred times South Africa's got great policy. We lack in implementation. So one would say, yes, it's, it's actually correctly written and designed for women to advance in the sector, and yet we're not. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yeah. Good morning, good morning, ladies. And um, let me just say I agree with the fact that we should have a lit day today. <laughs> um, because just to answer your question, uh, Iman, maybe let me start from the fact that historically, uh, the consumers of energy have always been women. Mm. Mm. Last mile consumer of energy has been woman, women. If we take it from a domestic perspective, if we take it from a commercial perspective, ultimately statistics show that women are the last mile users of energy. So over the years, they've been consumers, right? But what's happening now is that women are shifting and becoming what is called prosumers, meaning they can become part of the production uh, value chain of energy production. Now that brings us to policy issues, to say, there should be nothing about us without us. I know it sounds cliche, mm. but you can't have policy being driven by those that are not the consumers of these, of these energy issues. So I think from a policy perspective, South Africa has, I must say, uh, comparatively gone pretty f um, much further than many countries in the world if you do a comparative advantage in terms of the, um, in terms of the policy um, area for women participation. Um, you're asking why is it, yes, we've got good policies, where does it, 
Where does it break apart? Why doesn't it happen? And again, why, the reason it doesn't happen or the reason things don't go according to policy is uh, implementation is because of the fact that all the other enablers are not in tandem with the policy. So for example, um, if, if we want to have women participating in the whole value chain from an energy perspective, we need to have an enabler which is called, for example, the financial, um, financial enabler. You don't have the financial enabler. If, you have, if women go and seek, especially women entrepreneurs, I'm speaking from a biased perspective here. I'm sort of speaking from an entrepreneurial perspective. They can't access that finance. Why can't they access it? Exactly, yeah. Because the financial institutions yeah. have not yet caught up with the day-to-day -day, um, changes in terms of where we should be. So their risk appetite is very high. I mean, sorry, very, very low. low. Whereas what we actually need here is a commensurate risk appetite which goes together with what we're talking about in the policy. South Africa, I think with the aid of United, the UN um, Women's Desk, 2018, I think uh, Pindila would be even in a better position to give me the year, but we went very far with the aid of the UN, uh, United Nations uh, Women's Desk in terms of putting together a policy that is gender sensitive mm -hmm. on the, on, from, on an energy, from the energy perspective. So we have those in place, but we, what we need to do is ensure as women, that's where we must play a role and become the proper prosumers as well, we need to play a role in society to make sure that all these enablers that are required, they catch up. Yeah, and we have to do that. Yeah. And I think our role here, as all the women in the room, Central Energy Fund, ourselves, uh, stakeholders, uh, corporate, is to ensure that the, the enablers are also moving along in tandem with our policy. Otherwise, it's a policy that cannot be implemented. And that's a problem. Well, I'm definitely going to circle back to this uh, towards the end to talk about where the opportunities are, how that access can be widened and broadened. Um, because it, you know, if, if you're facing 10 hurdles at the get-go, mm. chances are you're not going to be able to stay in it in the long run. And statistically, we've, we've seen a lot of businesses die within the first year of inception, more so in the sector where there's so much volatility. Um, so, Ayanda... And again, people will say, oh gosh, oh gosh, it's Women's Month again, now we're banging on about the transformation issue and visibility of women in the right places and in the workspaces and at board level. Are we becoming, and, and I'm saying this facetiously because I know the answer to this question, are we becoming too obsessive about women's visibility, particularly in the energy sector? You know, again, if I just go back to the point that women in South Africa are just over 51%. Uh, of the population, surely that's a pool for your human resources, isn't it? Um, so the other day the president was talking to the country and addressing us and saying that there is a limitation or not so many engineers and hence we have so many issues around the infrastructure of the country. And, and that may very well be true, but I think there are so many barriers uh, that we have in the, you know, in, in the whole community within the work environment, we have many barriers. We've got uh, barriers also in our own minds as women. And I think the point that was made that we don't have the confidence sometimes to say, I'm going to go for this position and I'm going to apply for it. Uh, in some cases, because we don't support each other uh, as women. And, and I think that is a truth that also needs to be said, that at some point when I feel that I've arrived, I'm at the top, I've climbed the ladder, then I kick it. Uh, and, and I don't lift as I rise. And I think it's very important as women that while we have our, um, you know, our opportunities in our own communities, we have to lift as we rise. And, and I think one of the challenges that we have uh, as women is that we, we are sometimes scattered all over the place. And I can certainly recall this when I was still very young in the, in the uh, engineering environment and I was the only one and you know, I, I didn't have the support. Uh, but you know, there were some kind men, by the way, who actually made sure that they pulled me up and, and go along with me uh, and you know, to the point that I ended up. Um, I, I think that as women, when you are at the top, you have the obligation to look out for opportunities for other women mm. so that you are able to start 
looking out for those opportunities and putting in capable women in those positions. You know, I'm very proud to say that at board level, at the SEF board level, we're more than 60% uh, women at the board level. Credit to the minister, yes. You know, it, it, it really shows a commitment that we want to change. But also, there is a, I think it's about another 50% at the EXCO level. Uh, so you, you've got to start at the top. As they say, the fish rots from the head. You've got to start at the top and make the changes there. And by the way, when you are there, women, in those roles, then you've got to start looking for opportunities in your own departments so that you can afford the women the opportunities to also rise. And we must support each other. We need to support each other through mentorship, uh, which has already been mentioned. And I believe that in doing this, we mustn't exclude men in these programs. You know, sometimes we say, no, we just want to do our own thing. We must pull men together. There are men here in the room to actually show that support. And I believe that there are many men out there who actually want to support us and assist us to rise and open up opportunities for us. But we also have to raise our hands. If we don't raise our hands, then it becomes very difficult. I mean, it's interesting to me, this uh, notion, which I'm sort of divining out of what you're saying, around the scarcity, that if, if I get in, I've got to keep it to myself because otherwise I'm going to lose the opportunity. Hopefully we come back to that in, I think, what you're trying to say or, or what you've said and which I want to reiterate is that there is enough room for everybody. Mm. If we make the space, there will be enough space for everyone. Rafi, well, let me turn it back um, to you. You're, an, you're a professional engineer. You Again, we talked about the fact that you don't often see people who look like us uh, in the same positions as us in the same sector. What are some of the ways that you have been challenging both gender stereotypes and just the capability of owning your space? Mm -hmm. so, so in the engineering space, um, first of all, when I got in the office as the president of EXA, my main mandate and my main duty, as Ayanda has even said, was to ensure that we start bringing more women in leadership. So what I then ensured that we do is appoint a CEO who looks like me, who is a black female. So EXA has now a black female CEO. And with her there, we then have to sit down and ensure that we agree on our values and where we want to see the engineering fraternity moving forward. I think it's very important that, um, and we don't often talk about it, you know, ethics, legal compliance within the space that we're working in, they matter. And it's also equally important for us to admit that as we bring in women in these organizations, we're bringing them into organizations that are already in trouble. So we also have to acknowledge the inheriting aspect of it. Women are inheriting organizations that are in trouble, which means that the same women that are inheriting these organizations that are now representing us in the space will need support and support like no other because they have to navigate a very difficult space. They have to make decisions that are not going to be making them favor favorites or popular. They will be unpopular with the decisions that they'll be making, which means that we need to make sure that we've ring fenced that space to say, we are here to support you. We are cleaning up. We've inherited an organization that looks like this, but we know where we want to go moving forward. Now, the second step of that comes with ensuring that the culture of the organization also is strengthened. We can't leave it out. You know, we need to find like-minded professionals, whether male or females, who believe in the values of that organization. We're going back to basics, which means that we will now start advocating for training, for development, for coaching and mentorship in the workplace. We want workplaces that are healthy. We want staff members that have a good morale. You know, we do not want the perception of women saying you have a woman leader. She's got moods. She's got an attitude in the boardroom. Men are emotional in the boardroom way more than women. I can tell you that I've faced it. So we need to <laughs> have faced it, right? So so we need to be open to talk about these things. We need to be open enough to support each other when we then have to deal with these matters. Then the next thing that comes about is, for me, the young engineers, the young engineering professionals, they are hungry to participate. I often say to them, I got here because I volunteered. <clears throat> you know, 
I do know we're dealing with millennials. They come in, they want flexible hours. They tell you, am I going to come in the office two days? If not, then your work environment is not mine, which means even in the workplace, we need to be a bit more agile. We cannot stand in the same place, yet we are living in a world where there's 4G, 5G, there's a chat, chat, chat GPT, there's AI. We have to adapt. We have to be agile. We have to understand where our weaknesses are are so that we can not start appealing to the young ones that are coming in because we want them to come into organization we want to diversify the think tank of the organization because that's how we're going to start moving in the future as we want so so those are some of the things we, we we're starting to now transform the space to start thinking futuristic to start being more accommodative to start being more agile but the one thing that i think is very important important is this pockets of excellence where women are concerned within the industry. And I would li like to challenge all of us to collaborate. Can you imagine having a woman's function about in the August month, how many women's function do we see? I'm sure we see more than 30, but those are pockets of excellence and we are preaching to the choir. Why don't we collaborate? Why don't we invite the men? Why don't we come with them in there and say, this is where we are? And we need you to move to the next step change. So collaboration for me, I believe, you know, it's it's a really important aspect of ensuring that we move with the times. We transform in, in the space that we are transforming in. I cannot stress a, a, a capacity building. Even for us as women in leadership, we still need to make sure that we identify our own gaps and we, we, we fill it up. We bridge that gap. So we need to admit where we have shortfalls and be open enough to work hard to then close those. And asking for help is one of the things that I always advocate for. So I think those are some of the things that we are doing. Um, as ex at EXA right now, we're planning Africa Engineering Week. It will be in September. A lot of the people who are helping with the planning are the youth, the young girls, the young gentlemen. They are the ones who are out there on Instagram, having lives, talking about engineering. So we're trying to now start bringing that fashionable aspect of being professional again, so that even the young ones can start assisting us with ensuring that they accept the diversity aspect, they advocate for inclusivity, and they respect one another in that manner. Yeah. Thanks for that, uh, Rafi. We're a lot of sobering points. Uh, Nosizwa, I, I saw your reaction there when, <laughs> you know, um, Rafi was talking about placing women at the head of oh, institutions trouble. that are already parachuting down. Mm. You wanna, do you want to share <laughs> share with us what you were thinking? Cindy. No, I'm best placed to share <laughs> on, I, 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 on her Cindy. behalf. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, actually, <laughs> actually uh, sorry about that um, girly moment today, but <laughs> Nosizwe, I know she was introduced here as a director in the Strategic Fuel Fund. Actually, she's just recently been appointed as the chairperson of PRASA, mm. the Petroleum <laughs> Race <laughs> Rail Agency of South Africa. Uh, well, yeah. Exactly. So, <laughs> so, so, so when she mentioned women being um, uh, appointed in organizations that are in trouble, I think uh, you can't make a better example of that. But you know, when I saw that appointment, no, Sizwe, literally, I said, I celebrated. Mm. I said to my children, finally, Prasa will get back on track. Mm. Oh. I, I, I know how brave you are. I know how, how you are in terms of your work ethic. You know, I know how you set your standards. And, and I was saying to my, uh, to my children, we will see for the first time Prasa coming up, putting in the public domain, KPIs and targets that they want to see, uh, to achieve. Mm. And you will see no Sizwe coming out to the public oh. to, to account on those, because that's the leader that she is. But uh, Iman, the point is that that is what women are capable of doing. Mm. And, and for me, as the country is in an energy crisis, I wish I would see more of those women coming out because I believe genuinely that the only way out of this crisis is through women. Mm. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I saved you there, I'll send you the invoice. Thank you. <laughs> so then we've just accidentally created a lovely platform to give your, your opening expectations then. Of how are you gonna you charge forward in this role as a woman? So. Maybe let me talk about um, in the energy sector. Um, currently, we're going through a transition globally. 
the energy transition. And basically what that does is that it's offering a lot of opportunity. Mm. I think, and I always say to my colleagues, and thanks Pindi Lashem, I didn't say thank you um, loud enough. <laughs> um, I always say to my colleagues, you know, the next generation is not going to forgive us if we don't take advantage of this transition that's happening now. The fact that we weren't on the, um, on the receiving end of any positivity in terms of the economic growth of this country before has been forgiven because of all the situation that we're coming from. But you will not be able to explain to your children why are women not involved in the energy value chain in the transition? We, talk, we spoke a little bit earlier about policy. Government has made things easier. They've put enablers in terms of um, women participation, youth participation, and also this issue called mini-grids, where you can actually get into the opportunity of uh, producing uh, uh, smaller amounts of energy for communities. So there are opportunities there in the energy sector for women now to grab and take hold of female entrepreneurs. So what is required is what we should ask. It's the knowledge, sharing that knowledge about the opportunities that exist. And I love the, the, the issue of collaboration, collaborating across the different networks of women, collaborating again across the different networks in communities to be able to take advantage yes. of those opportunities and get into the value chain, either as a producer of energy in the mini grid or as a supplier of the implements and components for those things. So there's a new revolution that's coming in from an energy perspective where we can actually participate. So and I'm very sort of excited about that. You know, um, first of all, we didn't think that 60 minutes or 90 minutes would evaporate like water through a colander and it's evaporating quickly. But the promise that we made to everyone who is joining us online and in the room is that we were going to share exactly how and not have, we were going to have a really specific conversation. So let's lay down those tracks, Ayanda, for, you know, um, an entre a would be a wannabe entrepreneur in the energy sector, particularly a black woman owned entrepreneur, in how to navigate the space. Is there, you know, a forum for, for women to collaborate and say, if you're just starting out, here's a couple of things that you need to know. Here's where you need to go for financing. Here's how you can develop that business plan. Here's how you get onto the supply side of things. And I'd love for us to just maybe just share mm. quite practically and specifically on that. So, so I think that if I look at the uh, SEF group of companies, for example, we really have many, many opportunities. For example, we've got a, a, a 67 billion pipeline of projects um, that we are participating in, that we have uh, incubated, that we are um, um, you know, investing in. Uh, and here's an opportunity for women to actually come in, especially uh, you know, those that have their own small companies that want to come into the value chain uh, and play part. Um, one of the projects that we have currently is the uh, Aqua uh, solar uh, plant that we're building up in Northern Cape. Um, certainly in building, it's almost uh, completed. Uh, I think there's another 12 months or so to go uh, before it is completed. But here's an opportunity, uh, particularly, of course, in that particular area of the country, uh, you know, for women to come in and supply whatever it is that is required there. So we do have a procurement process, uh, you know, across the group of companies, uh, you know, they have their policies where they do advertise uh, when there is an opportunity to, uh, you know, to play a part uh, in this 67 billion projects that we have. Um, so there are those opportunities to come in and we specifically, again, look out for opportunities to give business to women. So it is not only confined in the executive and management space that we focus on uh, you know, giving women uh, uh, opportunities, but it also happens in the procurement space, uh, where through the adverts, the normal processes, we advertise and we advise women to come in and play a part. So that, that is really a huge opportunity uh, to come in. And, and you know, sometimes, I mean, in sessions like these, we also talk, and if somebody comes up and says, uh, you know, to a, a, a SEF uh, lady who is here, or a gentleman for that matter, you know, I am interested in this, what can I do? You know, this is an opportunity to actually raise your hand and say, I would like to take, uh, a, a, you know, to play a part in this 
energy space, what do I do and what do you have for us? You know, we talk, we have conversations where we advertise what it is that we do. And I think here also, I'm sharing with you that there is a pipeline of 67 billion rand projects that we have. Uh, you know, over the next uh, little while. They're not going to well-connected people fronting. <laughs> Definitely not. We, we run a very, I think it's very important uh, that we don't compromise on the governance. <laughs> we certainly don't compromise on the governance. Uh, as a board, we make sure that we oversee on these processes uh, so that it is a fair, transparent process uh, and we don't target Iman and say, hey, my friend, come. Uh, here's something to eat. No. We open it up. It is a fair and transparent process. Yep. And it is something that we always make sure that from a board point of view, mm -hmm. in terms of oversight, we look at these things and, uh, you know, really go through the front door. Nosis, well, maybe just to turn it back to you then, you know, because this has been your bread and butter in, in a sense at the Strategic Fuel Fund. Um, what are we seeing that can make it, and what tips can you share that would increase the chances of someone coming through for funding? Okay, so uh, maybe just concretely, you were asking for some, uh, a concrete example. Yeah. The Department of Agriculture, together with the Land Bank, have just recently, I think three or four days ago, announced a women's fund, which is for um, provision of energy in the agricultural sphere. So the Land Bank will give women funding to be able to, um, to, uh, to provide energy for farmers, because they're very concerned about the food security issue, and therefore they've put a fund together. Recently, they've announced it, I think on the 30th of August, mm -hmm. uh, they recently announced that. So basically, um, it's for providing solar power or any type of renewable energy for the farmers. They'll, they will fund it through the land bank. So that's one concrete example that it just made it, you know, it was a small little announcement somewhere, mm -hmm. you see. Mm -hmm. And I was like, but why? <laughs> Why is this? I mean, I, it's because I found it's it. It's like it happened at midnight. <laughs> yeah. I mean, nobody no, little, anything. not first page anything. And there it was. They'll provide the funding and granting and grants. So Department of Agriculture um, uh, together with um, um, Land Bank. And it was announced by the minister, Minister Toko Didiza. Mm -hmm. So there are those type of things out there. For example, I also know that the IDC has also, is looking at also having a women's fund. Um, for energy as well. I don't think they've announced it yet, but I know they're in the process of working. So all the uh, development finance institutions are going to be making these announcements in due course to say that they are putting out money and in, in conjunction with the ministries, I think the ministries are going to be putting out grant funding that's going to work together with debt financing. Mm -hmm. So those are out there. And how do we access that information, I guess, is the question um, many women will ask. We, 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 we need to... That's why the issue of uh, collaboration and networking becomes so important. Yeah. And not by chance. I think we need to have, we need to come up with a structured way that says every quarter, here's a website, here's something. Women, can you access this? These are the opportunities and draw on all these um, websites and opportunities. Put them there so that there's a platform for women to actually access and say, this is where you go. Because they are out there, shame. And sometimes they actually get the funds. Sometimes the funds go back. Mm -hmm. I remember many years ago. Because we can't let the money go back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I remember that many years ago, uh, the, fund, the women's fund didn't get exhausted. And it had to be changed into some other fund. So, so, so those funds are there. And they say, when they put out a fund, they say it'll be used until it draws down. And if it's successful, then they go for fund two which is beautiful. Then you've got fund, you know, the second fund coming in. So I think that somehow we need to find a way, you know, uh, 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 of creating a platform where women can access these opportunities. And these are pure place. funds, not loans. So it's a fund, right? The fund, it depends on how they structure it. Sometimes it's a, it's a grant plus debt funding, which is why you find that they combine themselves together, a department and a bank. So you'll find that maybe the bank is coming in with either debt funding or with equity funding, mm -hmm. but the department is coming in with the grant funding. So they, they, you know, they, they change the instruments uh, according to the way they see fit. But uh, all I want to say, Iman, is that even if it's, it's debt, you might find that because it's mixed with grant funding, then it comes at a better 
um, right. less of an interest rate yeah. that's that's probably affordable because it's a fund, right? And and if it's a fund, they normally take equity. So normally, I think entrepreneurs are looking for equity. So they'll take equity in the organization and bring in money that's going to help your organization to grow. So I think those are some of the things that are, are out there and we should take advantage of them as women. Mm. Um, Pindita, I don't know if you, want, if you want to weigh in on this, uh, on this one as well, in terms of building the access networks. I mean, collaboration is, is one thing. You might find your potential collaborator in the room because you're attending you know, some of the gatherings and the functions, you're, you're hearing the conversations. Uh, but some women, especially women who might not even be in the urban you know, and, and settings like, like we are, uh, would never even hear of some of these things. So how do we ensure that the message proliferates so that other women can, can also have a seat at the table? Uh, thanks, Iman. I might not have the mechanism of how we can make it, but definitely it's critical. I was talking to one of the CEOs, um, SOE CEOs, I won't say who, and um, in my previous role, obviously advocating for the use of oil and gas in our energy mix. And, and I was saying to him, are you aware that we've got so much indigenous gas available in the country? Why are we not making use of this to solve this energy crisis we are in? And he invited me immediately to a Zoom session. I took him through our country's prospectivity in terms of gas and where the discoveries are. And he immediately said to me, please send me that presentation because this Saturday, me and my guys are meeting to talk about the energy space. So you can see that this collaboration is key, and this is why I think sometimes the men are ahead of us. Mm -hmm. They are not afraid to share this opportunity because they know that the size of the cake is so big. Um, Nosizo was just mentioning the fact that in most of these projects, you need equity participation. When you look at the equity ticket, it's so large. You can never do it by yourself. Mm. So we need those mechanisms, Iman of sharing the information, of networking. I'm glad today we're going away with one very big opportunity. I'm sure everyone is Googling now <laughs> uh, about this opportunity of the land bank and, and the Department of Agriculture. And it makes a lot of sense because in this energy crisis, it might just trigger a, a food security issue. And it makes sense that our government is concerned about energy supply to the agricultural sense. And, and you can imagine when the government says, I want this to be first and foremost afforded this opportunity to women. It would be such a pity if we don't turn up. Then they have to open it up to everyone. Mm. Then we say those opportunities don't exist. So that networking for me is key. Honestly, I went away from that meeting with that male CEO, shocked at the fact that people are meeting at the weekend mm. <laughs> to talk about the energy sector and what opportunities are available and this information that I've just said to, with him. And he was saying, I can't keep it to myself. I've got to give it to my network. Sorry, give me the be? present. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> let, me, let me also add, it was in a golf, uh, golf course yes. somewhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I don't mind hosting people in my living room. It's big enough. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then the other thing I want to talk about is, so for me, networking, networking is key, sharing of information and so on. And Nosis was making a suggestion about a, a quarterly po a portal. I don't know who's going to manage Nosis, but a very, very good suggestion. And, 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 mm -hmm. and probably chairperson of CEF, you can host us to coffee. I mean, these sessions, and, and there's nothing illegal with what we're doing. Nosis is putting information which is in the public domain, which some people may not know about. So we put things which are in the public domain and people, they know about it. But the one critical one that I would like to really leave um, uh, the, the participants in uh, with today is really our influencing of policy. We've just recently had the South African Renewable Energy Roadmap being published. And the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy saying, please give us your inputs. So we want to maximize in-country manufacturing and beneficiation of those projects. Do you have the funding issues addressed there? Do you have the women participation addressed there? We might not have, but as women here in this room, have we commented and given the department this feedback? So I think for me, it's very, very important that we raise our voices, we raise our collaboration, we actively participate in changing this energy crisis around Iman. You said something that just like sort of pierced as like an arrow through my heart when you said the opportunities are being created. It's a pity the women don't show up. 
um, that along, you know, in, in, in many instances, there are structural impediments to yeah. women getting a seat at the table. But often, and in, in, in the cases that Some you've cases, mentioned, sometimes, yeah. it's not there. And all we are required to do is to be prepared mm. and to walk through. Mm. So I think and, and to learn where those opportunities are. Because sometimes the reason we don't turn up is because we don't know that the land bank has got this big opportunity. So how do we create those opportunities for us to share the information, to collaborate? And you, in your earlier comment, said you might not have, of those 10 requirements, you might have three. Someone in this room has got the other five. Yeah. And the other person has got the other two. Yeah. So that JV structure... <laughs> There we go. Can I just get a round of applause? <laughs> that JV structure meets all the requirements that the yeah. procurement department itself is looking for. <laughs> they want a whole person. So exactly. I'll bring this and you bring that and we'll, we'll get it together. I, I really love that. And, but it then feeds in again, um, uh, Sasayanda, to that important thing mm. of the platform for collaboration. In your observation, in the work that you've been doing, um, how easy is that to, to create? And, and by the way, if you look at you know, studies by the World Bank and others about, about why men have access and, and sometimes seeming, seemingly greater access to loans and to funding and so on, part of it is the network that they have created for themselves, the boys clubs that they, they keep together. And I just want to reiterate, I know that we've said a couple of things this morning that might make the men in the room feel a little uncomfortable. It's not that we are coming for you, but we have been in the space where we have been frustrated uh, and women have been frustrated for so long um, that it does come across as, you know, it's, it's an attack on men, but it isn't. Mm -hmm. I think the, the concept of allyship, the concept of collaboration, of partnering, about being a champion for a talented woman who may not be in the room is something we very definitely need from our male ca counterparts in the sector. Sayanda. So, you know, you, you actually raise a, a number of points, and I, I want to reflect on a conversation I once had with um, uh, Nosizo when we're having tea, and that is that, we, we have a platform, many platforms, digital platforms, where we can actually share information. Uh, but women in engineering or in the energy sector tend to be very, very shy. We, we don't uh, do well in comparison with women who are really, you know, beautiful women who... Um, what you are know, you want saying to right now? Well, <laughs> listen, you know, women who, who really want to talk about you know, how, how pretty and beautiful I am. And Nosiso's children were saying, Mom, and, and I think she can relate it better, Mom, why don't you guys, we, we don't have role models. Mm. Yeah. The role models that we have, you, you know, are really beautiful women, uh, you know, women who really just do other things. Uh, you know, in their lives that are not necessarily in the energy space. And when I say other things, I'm not talking about illegal or anything like that, but just in different professions. You know, they're out there and they, they, they are really visible. Mm. Uh, you know, they are visible about what they do. But in the energy space, we don't have those platforms mm. where we actually show our children that, by the way, there is a career in, in the energy space. You can be an economist, a financier, or, or you know, whatever it is that you can be in there. So I think that one of the opportunities that we have is to actually leverage the digital platforms to talk more about how to access all the information that we're talking about and, and not just focus it only in the beauty field, uh, you know, talking about how, you, you know, that's also necessary. Uh, I think I, I, I'm just trying to look for, for the best the way to say it. I, I, I got you. It, I, I, I got you. Yeah. But, but what I want to say is I want to affirm that you are all beautiful. Yes, hey, of course you are. Where the issue might be is what, you, what, what you're saying is around the visibility. visibility. And about visibility. making, you know, kind of bringing sexy back to, to yes. engineering and, mm. no, you've got <laughs> and, and, and into and the energy yeah. sector. Yeah. But, but the other point I also wanted to make is that, uh, you know, just reflecting on the role that women play, the multiple roles that we play. Uh, and, and I mean, I was deliberately talking about how we organize ourselves in our families, how we are home CEOs uh, or CEOs of our enterprises. We have got so many skills that we use at home, which are actually portable. And, and for somehow, we tend to leave those at home because we tend to, as women, split ourselves up and say, this belongs to my home and to my house. It actually doesn't belong to, uh, you know, to the work environment where we work. And actually, we need to bring those skills across 
and use them across the board. Because after all, you know, you are one person. You can't split yourself up. Yeah. Um, so I think for the, the point for me is that we must never doubt our capabilities. We, we run homes. We, we have done stock fails before. The stock fails now have been, uh, you know, taken over or uh, funded, uh, you know, by the banks because they know the potential and the massive amounts of monies that are in there. And who started off the stock fails? It's women. It is. You, you know, you start, we start off so many things, uh, but then we want to keep them and contain them in our homes mm -hmm. instead of putting them across and saying, actually, you know, we can use all of these skills in the boardroom, in my business, uh, and in everything else. So we, we really have to, you know, start um, multitasking, which is really our best uh, capability. We have to multitask. We've got to bring all of these things together and make sure that we can continue with yeah. the sustainability. Very of sobering. Our very sobering because we're at a time where we have to be hyper-focused and, and multi-focused um, because there's so many things that we need to achieve at the same time. Mm. So that's a, a really wonderful, I think, and really powerful reflection there. We're going to go to Q&A. So if anyone has any questions in the room, just make sure you get your hands up so we can get a microphone to you. Tell us very quickly who you are and who your question's directed to. Um, but if you were, before we even go to the questions, maybe just a, a final thought for you, a quick thought, um, just to round off... A, what we've been talking about right now in terms of visibility, collaboration, information sharing. I, I couldn't agree more with uh, um, Mem Ayanda on this one. Um, we are not taught in, in certain instances to really be out there and be influencing. Um, but I think that we, we are changing. The times are changing. We've got a lot more young people who are proud to actually be taking pictures in their hot heads and influence others. The most most important thing is for the upcoming young professionals to have role models and to see us being the engineers, but it being also being cool, also being fashionable, so that they can relate. It's about ensuring that there is an aspect of relatability in the process. So when I walk and, and I visit VUT, for example, or any institution of higher education, I am not shy of actually ensuring that the young girls or the young guys can see that you can be an engineer, you can look cool, you can be yourself. I'm a mother of four. You can be a mother of four. Just surround yourself with enough support, but go out there and get what you do want to achieve at the end of the day. So I think it's really making sure that we are visible and we are relatable at the end of the day. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rufilwe. Um, to our online audience, I'm receiving your questions as well, so please send them through. If you want to make a comment, you're more than welcome to do so. Right, but we give it over to the room first. Anyone have a comment or a question for our panel? Um, Nompu and, and then, okay, so we've got some hands at this table, and we can start at the back. Okay, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. My name is Takarani Kashane, and... Um, I have a small SME, so I'll be talking to some people so I can get serious in this sector. I have a question, and it's coming from uh, the comment that Rifilwe uh, made earlier about agility in the workplace, and that to accommodate millennials, we need to actually work differently. My question is, what are we doing with the younger, uh, 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 I'll call them teenagers at school, to encourage them and to be agile for them to actually be ready for, for the world that we're living in now because education is still being done the same way that it was done in the 70s. Unless if your child can afford to go to a private school, mm -hmm. if you're going to public schools, you're getting educated the same way that people were educated in 1977 or, or, or as far mm -hmm. back as that. So what are we doing to make sure that we can actually get these kids uh, 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 the right kind of education that will prepare them to become future engineers. And I'll actually uh, ask my second question in the same uh, um, uh, line. And the second question is that when a teenage girl becomes pregnant uh, uh, in grade nine, standard seven, uh, um, then they get a grant from the government to raise that child. It's a little money, but they get money. What are we doing with the girls that don't get pregnant? 
why don't we create incentives to make sure that when they get to grade 11 and they're during fall pregnant, they get something. When they finish metric and they didn't get pregnant, they get something. So that they can actually be encouraged to do that. Because in rural areas and in townships, our young girls are actually perishing through ch um, uh, teenage pregnancies and it's harder for them to come back and, and survive. So my, my two questions are that, what are we doing in terms of education and what are we doing to incentivize young girls to go on with school. Takami, thank you for those. We'll do a first round. Should we bring the microphone to this table? I have a mic, but uh, I don't know how it works. Um, this is uh, <laughs> Nompumela Losizi, but I wanted to ask um, Rafilwe. Um, she talked about the very issue that the previous questioner um, spoke to, which is around agility, you know, wanting to bring in more millennials and all of that. But I wanted to ask, as people who are running businesses, how do you get the balance right between accommodating young people's flexibility needs while ensuring that they actually do come to work so that they're able to learn and be mentored by you guys? Um, and uh, the, you talked about culture. How do you instill a culture when people are working from home? How do you get that balance right? Thank you. I think there might have been one or two more questions at this table. Nombri, we can just pass the microphone on. For you, sir, did you want the, the microphone or no? Uh, good morning. My name is Moses. Sorry, say again? My name is Moses. Soban uh, Bagiti. I'm going to use my language. Yes, yeah, sure. But you have to speak into the microphone. Uh, I see comment here in Tingi Kuruma, in Zukuruma, Zukuruma is Zuruan, it's Sanganana, I want to have a shop. Minan Kuruma and I went to the networking. Kuruma and I went networking, they show UCC. In networking, it's very, it's very, very, very easy. It is. <coughs> Mina, na 20 years, 21 years, in some attenders. In the important, in the Buddha, I want to one. In the subclub, I got it from much. Abo mama, maba kruben, ba fikirani information, number one. Right. Bokona lento by biza e in the young Zusipu. E by biza is a week. It's a week. The government they keep him sabins. So we can keep him sabins the government. Abo mama be by Enzani. Bawa migas are my venai tree. It's a week. Government they keep it. La maven and Kabawa thinks it. I share really Malacon. Number two, any things we call my food. Nyankela van Bagiti. Manfung ba right clean to leza matenda. Kakelani miyango kokotan, genan, yima department in Ibangen. Maning ama project hilanga pants. Ema main. Gunama potal. Ku government department in Mfungun Chela Bomama. Kwana in the Pumi the government department. Ihouten professional government. Babiza, I picati. Ngalani register ngu pikati. Ama quotation manja, ama quotation sawenza, apuma ku pikati. Asabenza ku honga ama government department. Abo department of health, department of ban ban ban. Ngalani register ngu ku pikati. It's free of charge. Aisaya kwa rento uti manji. Uzo ya zban, nga pagati uzo piwa wabani msebenzi. Ngalani bo ban babo mama, njoba sila. Okay. Okay. Maybe the e, e, ama e, ESD, yeah. gu ESD, ESD mm -hmm. abanga ya ziminishuti supplier, enterprise supplier development. Yeah. Moses, if I may, 
from what I understand, mm -hmm. Moses is sharing a number of obstacles Obst and barriers to, to entry for him being successful the with his tenders? Or? No, I think what I'm picking up is, one, he is highlighting some of the challenges that we create for ourselves. Yeah. And he's also now advising, he's been tendering for 21 years or so, and he's advising, he's offering advice where to, go. Uh, to where women to go. where to go if you want to be successful. Can we hear the end? Mm -hmm. um, was, did we get enough? Did I, we get all the juice? I, I think, yeah, there's more. Um, yeah I, I mean, the colleagues here have got the... <laughs> okay, we got the juice. I, th I think the juice, the, the gist is there. All right. Yeah, the Thank you so much, got. Moses. But maybe you can explain. Yes. I, really, I really appreciate that because that's been the topic of what we're, we're saying, is to share what we understand, mm -hmm. to share conventional wisdom and our experiences. I don't know if you want to just expand a bit more well, I, I, for I those mean, of us I, who I, didn't I, understand. Yeah, well, I, I really want to appreciate uh, uh, Moses for, for, for raising and sharing this. Uh, and, and I think it's very important for us that we, we, we really try and do what he's suggesting, that there are many opportunities out there, and all we need to do is to just get up and kick the doors. Go and get, uh, you know, get registered uh, on the platforms that he, he, he mentioned uh, so that we have access and we, we don't find ourselves uh, saying that, um, uh, you know, the selectivity here and it's only preserved for some. But the, but the main point I really wanted to just amplify from what he said as well is that he's saying that we as women sometimes are our own enemies. We hide information. When I have information, instead of telling other women, we think that, you know, it's, it's a scarcity mentality, mentality. which, you, you know, and, and there is so much for all of us, colleagues. There is really so much for all of us. And I think the point he's making is that we must stop hiding information um, and, and we must share. We must share and we mustn't think that just because I've shared with Iman, with Nosizwe uh, and Refilwe, uh, then I'm not going to have, you know, all of it is going to go, come to me. Uh, so I think that's a very important point. Thank you so much, uh, Moses. Really appreciate that. And, and what I'm hearing constantly as well is about being intentional about the sharing. And maybe it has to be organized in, in a way. You talked about a platform, Refuel, and we're going to come to you now around the digital platforms and, and some of the questions that have been raised for you in the room. But there has to be a repository, an, almost an immediate repository where people can put, hey, this is happening. Here's something opening up. Here's an opportunity. What are you in? What am I in? A community uh, that could potentially you know, advance this idea of, of real collaboration. Refuel, Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to share a story of what happened this weekend. I've got a sister of mine who um, is 10 years younger than me. She planned an event in two months. And that event was on Saturday and she called it our weekend. I've been planning African Engineering Week with my ex colleagues for six months. In two months, she got the room filled with more than 1,200 guests. It was sold out. When I look at the Africa Engineering Week, I'm not even halfway where I would like to be. In two months, maybe it's just me that's having that. a difficulty hearing. I think we just volume. need the volume to be up just a little bit, and maybe just share with us again, uh, Rafael. We're sorry, sorry about that, guys. Okay. All right. Can you much hear better. me now? Much yes, yes, much better. Is, is it better? Okay. Yeah. So I was sharing a story about um, my sister and I. Um, she was planning an event, and she started planning it two months ago. And I've been planning with my exit team engineer, African Engineering Week in, for six months. She, in two months, managed to get a thousand attendees of her event. It was called Awakened. It was over the weekend. I'm not even halfway at 500 yet. I've been planning it for six months. When I observed her manner of planning it, it was very clear. She did not have the long planning that I had. In fact, I asked her to give me her plan. It was half a page. And when I look at my plan, it was two pages. I even said, you're not going to do that. I have a plan. This is, you need to articulate every single thing. She said, sis, you need to market it. Sis, you need to be out there and talk about your event. She managed, and she's a millennial, to get more than 1,000 people. When we were at her event, I looked at her people, her team, and how they observe protocol. Everybody was laughing. And I I was like, but when we observe protocol, we're going to have a long sheet with names, say names, where these people come from. And by the time we finish observing protocol, one hour is gone. They are doing it differently. 
when I sat there, I kept on taking notes. And I started thinking, are we doing something wrong? Are we slaves in our minds when it comes to being a professions, professionals that we're not appealing to the younger ones? Hey, event was full of young people. So when I talk about agility, when I talk about ensuring that we have space for those millennials because they think different. I'm saying it is a give and take. We need to assist them with their work ethic. We need to teach them certain things, but we must be open to learn from them because they do have some recipes that are appealing in the day and age we live in. I'm not a person who uses digital platforms and social technology, but I'm learning from my sister that maybe I can and still talk to what I am doing and still talk to appealing to the younger generation and still expose the younger generation of what engineering is, that I am an engineer, I am a mother, I have multiple roles, but I can be a well-rounded professional in that, in that space. The young professionals and the young students at schools do not hear about values, do not hear about ethos, do not hear about principles, do not hear about objectives and ethics. All that they're hearing is corruption, corruption, corruption. I went and I had a chat at the University of Technology last week and I asked them, do you know what ethics are? Do you know what your values are? The students said, no, the room was filled, more than a thousand students from different schools. And I asked them, do you know what corruption is? They said, yes, it's every day in the media. So what is the student's diet looking like? What are we feeding them? Because it is important for us to understand that we need to control the diet so that they can be nourished. And if all that they are seeing and all that they are hearing is all the negative things out there, we're forgetting that we also need to do our part in instilling the positive stuff so they know what it is. So for me, number one, when it comes to agility in schools, it's access. We need to be accessible. The students this, the, at the schools, at universities, they need to see us, they need to hear us talk, they need to be relatable, we need to t tell our story. But number two is exposure. What we could do is take them and go show them a, a plant at one of ESCOM sites or at the water utilities or anywhere else. They need to see what's out there because they don't know. They don't have enough access. Some of them don't have internet. So it's our duty to move them out of where they are and show them what else is out there. So those day trips that you find, let's dedicate it to them. So we expose them to what's out there. Now, Number three is let's try and instill and do our best in instilling those values, reminding them of it is okay to be a good person. We all have good in us. We just need to make sure we live to it, right? Because they need to see that there are people who are leaders who are known for the good. They need to see that you can be good, you know, um, and, and it's very important for me, as I was the chairman of Val University of Technology, at some point I was there as a chairman for 18 months. And I walked away, I resigned. Um, and it is okay for me also, as the person who's in the leadership space, to tell them I did walk away from being your chairman. Because at that time, what was important for me was Val University of Technology and not the leadership role I was in. It is okay to walk away. It's not failure. It is still part of learning, but it is part of the growth. So it is important to have difficult conversations as well with the students so that they do not only see a person who's only successful and only smart, but they understand it is a process and you bring them in confidence within that vulnerability that you go through as part of the process of growing. When it comes to the, the, the questions of incentives, I couldn't agree with you more because I do think that as we say, the woman must push the doors down and, and, and knock on doors. There's also the other side. As an engineer, there's equal and opposite sides to everything. But there's also that other side that says, once they do that, there are men who take them for granted. There are men who look at the young girls and actually say, I will be your blesser. That term is not there for Mahala. It's there because there is something that, that happens to these young girls who go asking for help and they are taken advantage of. So when we then start having an incentive scheme, we limit the aspect of a young girl going to knock at the wrong door. So I really appreciate that. I do think it's something that we need to look into. Incentivize good work. 
incentivize being in STEM. Make intention of making sure we pipeline the STEM, the STEM pipeline so that we have more girls that are coming, but we have intentionally incentivized them so that it is not only appealing as something they enjoy, but it also helps them with their circumstances. Black tax is there for a reason. That terminology is there. We know it's there. We can't ignore it. So how do we still support these young girls who go to school but also have to go back home? home to cook and take care of their families. So it is really something that we need to dig deep in and, and, and have depth when we when we explore the space in, in, in its entirety. When we come to the culture of the organization, it is not going to be easy. Again, it goes back to intention. It goes back again to saying, tell me, millennia, what your view of the world workplace is and I'm telling you where I come from but I'm also going to say let's meet each other halfway what I say to all graduates is when they graduate they know nothing as soon as they enter the workplace they are there to learn as much as they possibly can from every single person in that workplace there is is a, a certificate that says they have their potential but they are not there yet they they still have to get the experience and the experience you get from every single person you will work with. Therefore, when you start instilling work ethic, we need to start by introducing them to that. A lot of them are pompous. You will feel it, but they, are, they need help. They are misled by TikTok. They are misled by social media. They are misled by so many other things, but they still have the skill and the knowledge that you can nourish and make sure that this person and is then groomed to being what you want. So I think we need to meet them halfway. I know a lot of the times I'm getting people complain about my young graduates and say, these people are disrespectful. And when you look at it, as a person who comes from a, technic a technician background or technologies and they've got a graduate who's an engineer and already there's dynamics because the engineer is telling them, I did the four-year qualification. And the technologist says, I've been in working 25 years, you know nothing. So it's again the dynamics that as the, the, the matured ones and the wise ones in the room, we need to then start looking at these young ones and also help. Um, and so so I think it, it it really requires us to to open our minds to it. It is challenging. It does take time, but they are here. They are our future leaders. We need to work with them. Thank you. Thanks, Rafiwa. In fact, researchers at this point are saying this is the first time, I think, in history that four generations are actually in the workplace at the same time. So that's another yeah. challenge. Besides all of our biases and assumptions that we make and some of the, you know, the other issues we have in the workspace, the fact that so many generations need to begin to sing from the same hymn sheet. Okay, I don't know what to yes. do because now we're definitely out of time. I want to share one or two thoughts from our online um, audience. PH says, where can we access a copy of this announcement from the Land Bank? I think that's really lit a fire here today. Um, so we'll if there's time, we can, we can just reflect on that. And also, uh, PH says, I can only see find the it. following. These are some of the, the DFIs and the funding instruments. Uh, instruments: Sawima IDC, which is not exclusive to women. WUSA, not clear if they have any available. D, uh, DBSA and a Women Enterprise Development Initiative. It's high time that the country avails access to this information. It is also correct, uh, and this was for you, Dr. Pindila, that the, the equity contribution must qualify for this funding. The equity contribution to qualify must be reduced because the criteria for funding often includes shareholder investment. Um, just kind of keep that in your mind because you can factor that in as you make your closing statements. But I, I do want to afford you the opportunity to make one or two more observations, perhaps one or two more questions. Okay. So we'll start there. Anyone else on this side of the room just so we can be really quick? The gentleman here with the mic. And uh, a third one at the back, and then we will close it off. Is that okay? There is going to be time to network, and I want you to be able to do that um, as well. Go ahead. Um, okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Arusani from AEMFC. I just want to start off by asking. We spoke about the Can the I ask golf you course. to just increase the volume and oh, say okay. your name for us again? My name is Arusani from AEMFC. So I just want to start uh, by asking, we spoke yeah, about the golf course where men share information. So I just want to ask, where is our golf course? If someone knows, please invite me. If there's nothing, <laughs> let's do something after this. Um, and the second question is, I think it's for everyone on the panel, is I think I once read a book, and I think when I was starting off uh, by Sheryl Sandberg, it's called Lean In. Oh, it was given to me as a graduate. 
And then it, it basically talks about how women leave the table before it's time to leave the table. So I just want to know from everyone on the line that um, as top management, what are you doing in your respective um, organizations to, to make sure that this doesn't happen? I understand we have the policies in place, but how do we bridge that gap and meet the policies halfway and make sure women don't leave the table when it's time to leave the table? We have this gentleman. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. My name is Simi Mohammed. Secondly, I just want to thank myself to be here to support uh, Abu Mama. And then because of, uh, I've been covered with two things. This, uh, the former speaker has spoken about education and pregnancy, but I'm going to comment on the issue of a woman. Because a woman, she's a very uh, a powerful person. We're discussing this, I and my friend, uh, yes, day before yesterday. I said, you know, my friend, every man who goes to work is because of a woman. And, in, and in the woman, they've got uh, a power to build and to destroy a man. I said to them, you know, we as a man, we as a man, we don't have powers. And in, to, to collaborate my statement, if a woman is angry, she will cry. We men, we don't do that. We think otherwise. And then women, they must start now to encourage themselves and then give each, uh, each other information to say that this is what is happening. And they must start doing sub something because we men, we support them. And then we are, we are men today because of women. If a man can deny that that person is single, is sleeping on a single bed, uh, we are saying... We are what we are because of a woman. Women, they've got powers. We've been raised by women. And to show that a woman, a woman, she's powerful. She can, she can conceive a child for nine months, which is something a man cannot do. So I think that if a woman can be in that position, the issue of nepotism and favoritism can end. And corruption can cease in South Africa. Because a woman is somebody who is capable you know, Tina, I'm speaking about me because I'm a man. I'm a married man. And then for you to see that a woman, I don't know if other men, they are not romantic philosophers. But to see a man that she's a woman, when a, man, a woman starts to cry, a man pay attention. To show that a woman, she's, she's capable. So what I'm trying to say is that women do not despise your capability. You've got it. You are a different woman who've got an ovum. You are better than us because we don't have it. So this is your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, go Hi, ahead. My name is Gorat Khitsani. I'm an independent consultant, having spent about 10 years uh, with some of the um, consulting companies. So solution mode. So I do business to government. See, so I create a, a platform for SMMEs to get business uh, within government. So maybe solution mode. Let's let's because uh, there's a buzzword: collaboration, co collaboration, network, information. So first and foremost, let's register our SMMEs uh, at or through the central database. They call it what? Central System Database. You know, for ease of references. And then let's take a deep dive. Maybe, Iman, you, you, you spoke about a repository. Maybe you can spearhead this. Uh, <laughs> I've got a day job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can help you with that. <laughs> let's look at a scan. Let's do a scan. Uh, we're talking about the energy sector. Uh, let's do a scan and of all the SOCs, SOCs or SOEs within the energy sector. Scan through, take a deep dive, and look for opportunities and register all, all the, 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 the SMEs that want to participate in, that, in, that, in, in, this, in the sector. And maybe as a sol solution mode, that, that's one way of going forward. Like oh, oh, um, Nociso spoke about opportunities, uh, CFE, CEF also has opportunities. There's a myriad of opportunities out there. So all we need to do is let's do a scan, have a repository, and, and, and collaborate yeah. and network. 
Th there's got to be you. a more agile, more yeah. organized way, I think is what you're saying. Thank okay, so thank you so much for the comments in the room. I hope that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it all to you. Um, thanks for, for all the comments online as well. I think even though we may not have accomplished everything that we wanted to talk about today, I think we've done enough of oxygenating and opening up the space for us to see, you know, what are we missing, where are, are our potential blind spots. And as we begin to wrap in your, in, in your closing statements, maybe you can reflect on some of the questions um, that have been asked, uh, some of the perspectives that have been raised, and after this conversation, what, what some of your, your biggest takeouts uh, have been. And uh, Nosiswe, maybe we start, shall we start with you or you want to you wanna keep yours? No problem. Go ahead. Thanks. I just wanted to answer, um, make sure that the people who are participating online don't feel ignored. So the, the, the fund, it's called the Agro Energy Fund. It's 1.2 billion Agro Energy Fund. Um, and if they go into the Daily Maverick of the 29th of August, you can actually find the article about it. And it's called Agro Energy Fund Launches. That's the article. So to help the person who put yeah. um, something in the chat room. Okay, so um, like you said, um, Iman, we, you, know, um, you, you can't exhaust this topic. Um, so maybe just to crystallize it. Um, my, my whole thing, Iman, is to say I'm trying to encourage women youth especially as well, to please get out there and grab these opportunities that have been made available. And that's sort of my, my thrust, because I just worry that sometimes we're missing the opportunities, but they are there. We're also missing the, the, the one other aspect where we have an opportunity to have very good strategic equity partners now. Recently, we just uh, came out of BRICS. One of the specialities of Brazil is actually lighting up the communities, mini grids. They've actually specialized in remote um, generation of electricity for communities in the rural areas. So we have an opportunity through the BRICS, again, through the, maybe the BRICS Business Council or BRICS itself as a, as a, as a, as a portal, to go and find how does one actually perhaps be able to join uh, 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 that network and be able to, I know the word has been used 40 times already today, <laughs> collaborate. <laughs> Unfortunately, that, that's what it is. How to be able to use that opportunity to collaborate and, and, and learn. Learn how can we learn this technology that we can actually put uh, down. And it's being done, by the way, not by engineers. This is the beauty. It's women in these communities, and that's why they've become the prosumers and not just the consumers. The women in the community are the ones that actually find these solutions. So, so, so we, we do have a world of opportunity out there, and it's just about, you said this morning, let's, let's vavavoom. It's just about saying, guys, it's happening out there. We're in a special time. There's a transition. How can I grab hold of this opportunity, and let's work and let's go? That's what I'd like to leave with us for this morning. Thank you. I love that. I love, I love, I love what you said. Um, and somebody said, if the future, as you see, it doesn't exist, you've got to create it. Yeah. We've got to create it. And a lot of what's been said here today is actually showing us exactly how, how we can do that. Pindile. Uh, thanks, Iman. Uh, thanks to Seth for creating the platform. I think the question was asked, where do we have these golf courses. I think this is one of them. And thanks to Seth for creating it, and hopefully they'll create even more. <laughs> um, and, and, and for me, also, it's about um, us being deliberate, intentional, attending such events, getting to network. Trust me, I think one of the objectives must be to leave this place with just one other contact that you didn't have before. The gentleman at the back talked about the platform that he has. Grab his number, learn how the platform works, and, and so on. He so says he knows people who knows people. Okay. <laughs> so. That's fine. And let's create that platform. And maybe we are supposed to create that platform ourselves. Yeah. If it's not there, you know, we're looking for a platform. Maybe it's time that one of the young people that Refilo was talking to creates one, you know. Um, 
and then I'd also, I think in, in parting on my side, just want to say that I, I genuinely want to thank all the women in my life who gave me opportunities. I am where I am because these women did give me opportunities. But equally much, I do not believe that I was in the shadows when they gave me these opportunities. I never held back. I am quick to, to write opinion pieces. I'm quick to say there is this problem. I believe this is how the organization can go about resolve, resolving the challenge of the Biomass George project in, uh, in George itself. I, I just, out of the blue, think I can't keep quiet when there is a problem that the organization or a project that is at a standstill. And respectfully, I would write how I think the, pro the project can be resolved. Yeah. When it comes to policy matters, I think as women, we are quiet. And, and, and we expect these policies to come out perfectly shaped. Yet if we suggest those, um, those inputs, or if we provide those inputs into those policies, suggest how those policies can be made to support women. Some of the people that um, I think have been closest to me in my, in, 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 in my um, last leadership position have been people who literally would sometimes indicate to our office, how best we can take South Africa forward. That's where the young people sometimes can, can, can provide very good thought leadership. Mm. And you suddenly realize, oh, this is something that I would have missed. There is no way, there is no way any leader would not want to have that person closest to them. Mm. Because that person is a solution provider. And that person can take initiative. So I think that it's very, very important that we don't just sit back uh, but we provide solutions to the energy crisis that we have. And of course, uh, the last person said it, it's our time. It really is. Thanks. Ruth, we'll be closing, quick closing thoughts on your end. Thank you so much. I, I couldn't agree with, him, with this, uh, Pindy Lemoy. It is our time indeed. Um, so I would like to encourage everybody to really go out there, understand what is out there. If you need help, ask for help. Do not sit alone and you're struggling to navigate the space. Know that you can always go out there and seek help and you will receive that help. Uh, I am available as well to assist. Anybody can reach out to Fulia Butelezi um, at LinkedIn. Um, so, and I thank you all for this. I think let's continue having these discussions. Let's continue digging deeper. And I would like to congratulate this, uh, um, um, if another name misses me, um, the, cha the chairman of PRASA, one of my panelists is the chairman of PRASA. All the best with your new role. Um, you have inherited a difficult one, but you have our support. We are behind you all the way, sis. Thank you very much. Uh, it's it's soon to become one of the most famous names in South Africa. Uh, Nosizwe Makamo. Thanks, Rufilwe. Okay, this so... Is yes, yes, thank you. We have heard from everyone, and this is really you know, as, as a result of the initiative that you've put together of saying, if there isn't a space, we're gonna create a space. Mm -hmm. I hope you understand what you've started now because there's just an appetite for this to happen more often, mm -hmm. to create more opportunities for people to get together. So I really wanna give you the last word. As you sit back and reflect on what these last 90 or so minutes have been and what you had wanted to achieve going into this gathering today, tell us what you're thinking and what's next. You know what I'm thinking right now? I want to shoot that dog that ate up our time. So in Corsa, we, so in Corsa we normally say, Iman, uh, it's just that sometimes when you say it in English, it, it's not, it I doesn't know. really have that. It doesn't you know? have it. We normally say in Corsa, Itesha Likiwe Yinja. So the dog has eaten the time. So I want to take a gun and shoot that dog that took the time because, you, you know, this discussion is just really. Um, you know, I just want the time to be extended. And it's such Do you a think it was event. lit? It is. It was certainly lit. It was more than lit. Um, what, what I do want to say, may, maybe just to first start off with the uh, repository. Uh, as I was listening to uh, the speakers and, of course, the closing remarks, I, I already thought that the repository, we have to start that from the Central Energy Fund. We need to look at what we need to do. Um, and I think I've got a couple of uh, um, um, uh, 
business cards which I need to collect so that we can start looking at it and see how we can do this and give access uh, you know, to women, because it certainly is an issue, you know, uh, not knowing about what's going on. And maybe, you, you know, we'll have to look at, uh, you know, the young ones coming in, helping us with it. Uh, you know, what sort of content are we going to put in there uh, so that we don't have to wait for a session like this, which happens once in a blue moon at the moment, uh, you know, to hear about the funds that are out there uh, that we should be accessing. Uh, so I will certainly uh, take up uh, that role. Um, the one point I want to make you know, really, is that the future is now. You, you know, sometimes we say tomorrow, tomorrow. The future is now, colleagues. It starts now. It starts at this time. Uh, there is so much information that I hope we have been able to share with yourselves, uh, you know, in terms of where we can go from here. Um, but what is key for me as a takeaway is that as women, we need to take up our space. We need to leverage our skills that we have as I said in the beginning, we need to bring them across so that we are able uh, you know, to take up our positions and, and really be vocal and be visible. And being vocal, uh, colleagues, doesn't mean being aggressive. Be yourself. You still can be vocal and be visible, but be yourself. You don't have to be uh, rude or anything. You don't have to be um, Mr. So-and-so. You just be yourself. Be authentic. Uh, it's always easier to be authentic because... You don't have to remember, uh, you know, what Mr. So-and-so <laughs> did. And also, the golf course, by the way, as it was already said, this is the golf course. This is the golf course. And also, the solutions actually lie within. Iman, you said there is a light in us that you cannot extinguish. No matter what happens with the lights going out, that one you cannot switch off. Mm. Uh, so we must always remember that as well, that there is a light in us. Um, that we can just light up and make sure that it can help us to fuel women into the future. But the future is now. Uh, and I really thank you that you have been here and uh, commit that we'll have another session. I'm not sure at this stage at what point. The first one that we need to start off with, however, is this repository. I think it's going to be very crit critical uh, so that you at least have access to information uh, and you know where to look for. Uh, and in, in, in a way, it's going to be its own um, uh, networking source uh, so that we are able to at least keep in contact and bring in more women. But please, beautiful women out there, let us not pull each other down. You, you know, we, we, we like, and, and I know we're not talking about that today, but it is one of our biggest downfalls that sometimes we think that, you know, you just want everything for yourself. You, you can't. I mean, the, the sky is just big enough for all of us. There is so much for all of us. I've never seen a star, Iman, that always says, no, the sun is too big. I want to be bigger than the sun. I have never seen that. All of us have our roles that we play in this earth. And be happy with your role and do it to your, the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, don't say that uh, Miss X, this side, uh, you know, I want to, you know, to dim their light or to switch it off. You just cannot. We all have a role to play. Let's take up the future. Uh, let's act now, and, and let's get out there and take up the opportunities. The problems that we have today, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, are really going to be solved by women. Absolutely. The men will create the problems. We will come in and solve the problems. <laughs> last one I must say, the last point is, there is a man, and I, you know, th this was very, really fascinating for me. Uh, the, we were just having a conversation uh, you know, with some men, you know, a very, very powerful men. And this man said to me, you know, sometimes when we get solutions or we get stuck, I go to my wife and I, you know, as we talk about work and so on, and she'll give me an idea. Mm. And then I'll go back to work and I'll share the idea. Of course, now it's mine. I'll share the idea. <laughs> but he was admitting that a lot of solutions actually come from women. Mm. Those men consult their wives about what they must do in order to correct a situation. So let's not underestimate our, ourselves. We've already been told that you are powerful uh, by a, a, a man who supports us. Let us use that opportunities, colleagues. 
We are really, really powerful. And I think we'll be even more powerful if we work together. together. Thank you. So, guys, would you say it was lit? Can I get an L? Okay, this is not going very well, so I'll stop there. <laughs> so they often say that in South Africa, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Well, there is a free lunch for you today. I woke up early. I made you some roast. I made you some vegetables and some rice. No, I'm just joking. Well catered, proper. We take care of you in this venue. So let's just maybe a last round of applause to all of our panelists and to the CEF. Thank you so much um, for this opportunity. Our guests... Uh, our guests again, Rafilwe Butelezi joining us online, uh, Dr. Pindile Masangane and uh, Ms. Nosizwe Makamo. Thank you very much for also allowing me to be on a first name basis with you. Just kidding. Uh, it's, been, it's been really illuminating, I think is the word of the day since we're talking about energy. Thank you for your time and your resource. You've also offered it to people in the room, so don't be surprised when they're all trying to reach you and get hold of you um, because when you make a promise... In. We keep, everyone is in. So thank you so much. A round of applause for yourselves for being amazing and for being in the right place at the right time. Write this date down because this is the date that marks the beginning of an amazing journey ahead. Who believes that with me? Yes. My mother always said I should have been a preacher. I mean, I'm not, but yeah. I just want you to believe that with me. Take the numbers, enjoy yourselves. Thank you so much. I think there's something, there's something coming for us. I love that. I love that for us. Are we getting things? Is it over 500 grand? Because then I have to declare it. <laughs> thank you so much, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So good to see you, Nasiz. And thank you for your messages. Oh.